Welcome to Living Wild Pot. That's not the name of the podcast. We're going to start that <laughs> off. <over. laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Wild Links. Colin Stuckert here, founder of Wild Foods Co. And welcome to the Ancestral Mind Podcast. I'm here with my co-host. He has no choice in the matter. <laughs> I just got promoted live Brent on the air. Philbin. What's up? How's it going? So today's show, we're going to talk about the first principles of living wild. And we're going to just briefly cover each of these main points because we're actually going to have later shows on each of these that are going to go, go more into depth. And so today we're going to just talk a little bit about what we talked about in show number one. We're going to review some of the mismatch principle, how our environment and our biology is mismatched and what we can do about it. And we're going to cover all the primary points from a broad perspective and then dive deeper into them later on, you know, probably episodes five to 10 is when we'll really get into them. Uh, Brent, you need to figure out what you're going to say f- about yourself when you come on the show. Like, how are you going to introduce yourself? Are you going to be like the crypto podcast guy? Are you going to be the guy who just moved to Austin is going to lo- lose 80 pounds? Are you Are you just the – my what, consigliere? Well, consig- since <laughs> our last show, I actually went ahead and changed my Twitter handle. You guys kind of – Between Colin and the listeners' feedback, uh, they, Chubby Crypto didn't make a whole lot of sense, especially if I'm branching out into more of these podcasts. So now my Twitter name, if you were trying to follow me – is Brentity. It's very it's a cool name, but no one's gonna be able to sell, spell it. So it, it it's my name Brent and then Itty. And well, so what's your tagline? What what's your position besides producer? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a podcast, podcast producer. Sure, you are, and you also are one of the hosts of the Crypto Basic podcast. I am. Host if someone of the wanted Basic. to go there, where would they go? CryptoBasicPodcast.com is how you can find that if you're interested in learning about cryptocurrency from the ground up, Bitcoin and things like that. Great. So let's just dive into it. Let's dive. Let's dive into it. And I'm so, going to make a big splash. Okay. <laughs> cannonball into it. I'm going to dive into it. You can cannonball into it or belly flop into it. Oh, okay. Ow. Yes. If you have a chance to go on iTunes, leave us a review. That is super appreciated. Uh, if you email me that you did that, I'll reply to your email and I'll give you a little present. So if you, if you do that, send me your iTunes review link and I will get back to you with something special. We call that proof of review. Anything, any screenshot, any... Any way you want to prove to Colin that you reviewed this podcast. Uh, we'll he, get you something special. Yeah. And so last episode, what did we go over, Brent? Just a real quick rundown. We did the quick rundown of basically what we're expecting from this podcast and going forward in the future. And then we really talked about environment and how environment can be affecting everything that you do, everything that you become. So this episode, we're going to really start to get into the overview of the principles of what we're going to consider kind of the backbone of the, the foundation ancestral mind podcast yep. here like these are the overarching concepts that you need to understand that you need to get into that you need to drill down in your brain it's going to shape the rest of this show and then in the future we're going to expand on each of these topics and we're going to have some really awesome guests on the show that are going to be specific either to the topic that we're talking about or just specific to a niche inside that that the ancestral living can really resonate with. So we're yeah, going to have gonna some really fun. cool guests. It's going to be fun. Now, before we get into this, do you know, because you follow Tesla and Elon Musk quite a bit, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what is he big on when he talks about how he built Tesla, how he built SpaceX? Like, what, What's the big thing he focuses on? He focuses on working 80 hours a week. Well, that's just not what I'm going for. But stone okay. cold <laughs> grinding his face off yeah. until he can't even breathe. But his philosophy on how he runs his businesses is based on what? First principles. Have you ever heard him talk about that? No, I, I mean, I know he's, I that's know he's how, all about like you need to be working eighty hours a week or you can't do anything. No, no. So that's not what I'm talking about at all. Uh, I'm talking about the way he thinks about his businesses and and the, and the things that a lot of other people in the industry, especially like rocket industry, for example, they're basically saying you can't build a rocket for less than this much. And he was like, well, let me just figure out what actually goes into a rocket. You have a certain amount of metal. You have a certain amount of screws. You have a certain amount of fuel you need. Like there's certain things and. What he figured out was all these pieces were basically being manufactured by different companies. Every company has to have a profit margin. Every company has to have a markup to be able to even survive, right? And so he's like, what if I could make as much of this in-house as possible and basically focus on what are the first principles of rocket 
technology. Like what are the first principles? What's the absolute minimum that I need to get in out of the atmosphere, right? And by doing that, by by basically figuring out that he can manufacture a lot of his own things and focusing on on a lot of those first principles that things that people in the industry that have been been in the industry for years probably don't even think about anymore. They just assume this is where we get our screws from. Yeah. What if we made our own screws, right? Like these are just things that were overlooked in the industry. And then you get into things like defense contractors and like how they're incentivized to actually charge a lot and, and, you know, big rabbit hole that that is. But his whole philosophy for how he operates business is very much based on the first principles. Let's go down to the base truisms of like physics of, you know, rocket technology and rocket science, basically. And let's take those first principles and use those to just think better about this market or this problem or whatever. You want to see how overarching this concept and this problem that we're talking about is go to your boss and ask ask your boss why you do a certain thing at your company. Hmm. Pick a thing, anything, whether it makes sense or not. Just ask them, like, well, why why do we write the reports on this program? I promise you, most of you are going to get the answer. We've always done it that way. And, or I don't know why we do it. Yeah, or or I don't know is probably also going to be a prevalent answer. But they're yeah. more than more than likely those that don't know why they do a certain thing are going to say the reason they do it is because they've always done it that way, and. Yep. That is, yeah, you need to look at the beginning. It's counterintuitive to first principle thinking because right. first principle thinking is going in with like Zen mind, beginner's mind, basically, yes. right? Wait, and, why do we need spreadsheets? Okay, we need spreadsheets for this reason. We don't need this particular company to run our spreadsheets. We can do anything. Or yeah. can we do it better? <clears throat> or, you know, let's just strip away all the the added junk that's been built up over the years and get down to the, the basics. And so that's really what first principles thinking is. It's a focus on the basics. That is what I'm obsessed with. That's how the ancestral mind came to be. That's how Wildfish came to be. It's like, let's get back to the basics. The one thing we know for sure without a doubt is that before we invented agriculture some 12,000 years ago, humans were alive in the wild with absolutely nothing other than sticks and stones and other humans. They they didn't have technology. They have iPhones. They didn't have toilets. And they didn't have industrialized food the way we do today. So we can know for sure a first principle of human biology is for the bulk of human existence alive on planet Earth, we ate foods from nature. Do you see anything wrong with that statement, Brent? Do no. you have anything that you can refute that statement with? No. there's. Th- so it is ironclad. Colin. Literally, that is an ironclad statement. The only counterpoint you could possibly have to that statement is eventually, because we definitely have done it today. Some people might try to argue this, but eventually science can figure out a way to put atoms together, together to basically create like the perfect food or the perfect supplement that could then bring out the best expression of the human body. But we haven't done it. Right. Yeah, I, I I use this argument with with people who are vegan all the time. Not that I'm trying to argue and stop them from being vegan necessarily. Like that's their choice. So the discussion I'll have with vegans all the time is questionable nutrition about what you can put in if you're only eating a plant based diet can go away. Like and and there could still be the focus on not eating animals. Once there is a synthetic meat that has the exact same nutrients that my meat has without putting things inside of the meat that make it bad for you right and it tastes better or at least equal then yeah i'm not gonna be eating animals anymore i'm gonna be eating the synthetic meat and i'm not even talking about price so as long as those things are equivalent i don't mind doing the moral thing and not eating animals but in the meantime i'm gonna eat them and a lot of them and that's because it's a first principle that humans have to get their nutrition from meat. Yeah. And we won't go down the rabbit hole today. We're going to have a whole show on that. For those that maybe have first heard, never heard this and everyone thinks that, you know, plant-based is the way to go. Well, you can't get B vitamins, particularly B12, from the plant kingdom, like at all. And if you don't ingest B vitamins, and, and there's other certain minerals and things that you have to get, they're called essential, meaning you have to get them from your diet. If you don't eat them, you die. That's really, should be enough. It's not. Um, and that's why all vegans, once they hit like year two and three, they have to supplement because a lot of times what the B vitamins in their liver kind of like dries up and they get run into major health problems if they're not supplementing, right? Uh, so again, topic for another day. The focus today is on first principles. That was just an example of real food, of being first principle. Now, I don't want to go too off down the, t- the tangent because I have a whole list of the things we're going to cover. We're actually going to go through the presentation we have created for the Wild Foods community over at wildmission.co if you want to find this and follow along. And we're going to go into the middle uh, into like slide about 15 or 20 and it, we're going to start at the ancestral view, how looking back is our best way to move forward. And then we're going to have seven points to cover on how to basically live more in accordance with your genes. You have anything to add before we get into it? I had questions about the the vegan slash uh, ancestral thing that I will save 
for that day. I was. Yeah, I feel like it. if I asked them, we would be going down a rabbit hole that we cannot recover from. Yeah, and I and I won't be able to resist. So you will literally force me down that <laughs> rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Uh, so the ancestral point of view, and again, go to wildmission.co. That is our free presentation. That will go into wild foods, what we believe, how we source. But then in the middle of it, there's a whole section on our first principles of living wild. So what you need to live as a functional human being that's healthy and that can live a long time. These are the foundational principles. Principle number one, real food. Real food is is the foundation of health. It is based on whole, real, raw, as close to nature as possible ingredients. Highly refined, highly processed ingredients are not real food. Foods that have been mistreated such that quality has been compromised are also not real foods. Foods that attack the human organism are not real foods. These include grains, added sugar, vegetable and seed oils, corn, and highly refined white starches. Think potato chips. Let me ask you a question real quick about real food. So often I'll talk about the difference personally between organic food and just regular food. So organic beef versus, or I guess, Yeah, an organic beef versus one that's not listed as organic. Yep. In my mind, it makes sense to me that the one that is not listed organic is actually better because it is treated with antibiotics such that we will not get sick from something that wouldn't be treated with antibiotics. Would eating the non-organic meat still make sense with this philosophy or am I completely wrong there? No, it's not because – and this is good. Again, though, we have to be very careful because it's a deep rabbit hole. But basically – Organic food versus non-organic food is one thing. Real food versus not real food is another. And there's like a million definitions and things or whatever. But to answer your question, when a food like grain-fed beef, for example, it's almost always not organic. So there's some exceptions, right? That is not a close representation to a wild animal or a food that we would eat in the wild because it's fed grains, which is not as natural diet. As a result, the omega-6 to omega-3 content in the actual beef itself is completely skewed. There's also more fatty tissue. Um, there's more the toxins actually live in the fat, like any antibiotics and things like that. There's more – the animals were more stressed and so they have – it just literally makes the animal less like a wild animal, which is going to be better, right? So the answer is no. It's a completely different animal. If you take farm salmon versus wild-caught salmon, you look at the profile of omega-3 to omega-6, minerals, nutrients, whatever, completely different. Literally different animals, okay? So that's the easy way to answer that question. Then organic and non-organic, there's a lot of things. There's farmers that do things beyond organic. They do it better than organic. Like they go w- above and beyond. Also, as far as organic goes, there's an entire list of things that are in or- inorganic substances that can be allowed in organic food, which you can find that at the organic website. Uh, we'll link below as well. So that's a whole nother topic because like it's not as simple saying this is organic, this is better. Like you can also buy organic cookies. That's pure junk food. Right. Right. So, so- if you're – if you're a listener and you're, we haven't released the rest of the episodes yet, so we haven't really gone into the food, and you just want to take it out of this podcast, and you're holding organic grain-fed beef in your left hand, and you're holding inorganic grass-fed in your right hand, which See, one a, do you that's take? That's a tough one. That is a tough one, but it would probably be the inorganic grass-fed. All right. Yeah, because the organic grain-fed is still going to be fed grain, soy, like and just a bunch of things. It, it like So that is more the diet. It may not have antibiotics used, but it's still more likely to be on a factory farm where it's more stressed, it's mistreated, it, you know, maybe it like lays in its own feces, things like that. Like there's a lot of other things that go on. Like even if you're not administering any hormones to this animal, it, there's still a lot of other variables. Right? Let's be honest. Who hasn't laid in their own feces at least once in their life? That's true. I mean. But every single day of your life, that would probably catch up with you. So that's number one. Principle number one, real food. And we're going to spend a lot of time on that on the show, but... Let's get to number two because we don't want this to take the next two days. Personal number two is sleep. I know Brent's got some fun stories on this one, but I'm going to read through <laughs> this before he even tries to get to that. So sleep seven to nine hours a night. Sleep ideally when the sun is down because that's how our ancestors would have slept in the wild. We basically would start sleeping when it gets dark and we would wake up when it is light, which is why you have things like circadian rhythm and things like that. Uh, sleep more when you exercise more and when dealing with stress. And so your body will naturally do this if you let it. Like last night, I actually slept 10 hours because I played racquetball for like two and a half hours yesterday. And I went to bed at 1.30 and that's actually way beyond, way, that's kind of early for me. I usually go to bed like 2.30 or 3. And I slept till like 11.30 and it was great. I felt awesome, but my body needed it. And that's something that people, you know, if you have a job or if you have a routine or whatever, it, it can be hard to do. A lot of people are the opposite. They get stressed out. They sleep less because they have to 
think about all the things that are stressing them out and they, they, yep. they wake up and then they're like, oh, I just got to do that thing that stressed me out. Yeah. And that's why you need like meditation and mindfulness. Uh, sleep in a pitch black room. Invest in blackout curtains. Use a sound machine. And then in parentheses I have here, it will change your life. We own about <laughs> we own about six of them and it literally will change your life. Turn off, unplug all devices in your room, especially any that emit artificial light. And then also if you have a Mac, I think it's Windows or Mac, get the application F.Lux. So it's Flux. If you Google that, install that thing, set it so that you lower the color temperature of your screen to be always that way. Mine's almost – in fact, it's like always on a constant – 2700 is what it's on now. It's tungsten. And so what it does is it eliminates blue light from your screen. It changes the color, which can have a huge effect on your circadian rhythm and, and your hormones and things like that. Avoid screen use one to two hours before bed. And then, oh, the last one was down on flux, but I skipped ahead for that one. Yeah. So a couple, a couple things here. I guess I've always been really lucky. I'm one of those people that I fall asleep instantaneously in so any conditions. Like doesn't matter what they are. doesn't matter what lights are on. In fact, I <laughs> I used to do the opposite of this. Uh, when I was playing a lot of poker and I was going to bed at like 6 in the morning, I would leave the lights on because what would happen is I'd go to bed at 6 a.m. when it was dark and an hour later it would get light and it would wake me up. So <laughs> I would sleep with the lights on. So I'm sure that contributes to why I'm an unhealthy dude and that is... Uh, it makes perfect sense, but I will give I'll give the listeners a just a one little quick anecdote for Colin here. I'm going to tell you how serious he is about his sleeping. We went to Denver a couple of months ago, and and I get there, and he gets there, and he's got his giant you know suitcase mm-hmm. like Meryl Streep style. He's pulling this thing behind him, and I'm thinking, man, he talks about minimalism. He talks about like. All this stuff, I don't understand why he's got such a big suitcase. Well, we get into the <laughs> we get into the room and I find out why he's got a big suitcase. He brought his own pillows. He brought his own sheets. He rips the sheets off the bed. He throws them in the corner, puts his new sheets on, whips out the duct tape that is also in there. And he starts taping things to the wall to block out all of the light. And all in the name of better sleep. And I'm like, first of all, I'm kind of impressed. Should have duct taped your nose shut too. But <laughs> I ruined all of his best laid plans because I snore. So it didn't matter. I, he wasn't getting any sleep. And he built a pillow fort around me in order to try and stop my snoring. I'd also throw a pillow at you every so often like to disrupt your snoring pattern. Sometimes it would like last for 30 minutes. Sometimes you start again. And I would like throw a pillow at you. And you would like you know, grunt, grunt a little bit, move around. And then like hopefully find a different position where you're not snoring as much. I'm, this is this was my struggle. And this is this, – You should have downloaded f and, and this is why people like you piss me off sometimes because you could just fall asleep so easily and – and that's why, I don't, and for me, travels is is tough on my body, and I have to do a lot of things to, to just like the first two nights at a new place. It's just really hard for my body to adapt, and so I bring duct tape, I bring my own sheets, my own pillows, I bring tacks so that I can literally tack the blinds close into the the, the wall, the drywall. Um, <laughs> oh, the the hard one is sleep detector, or no smoke detector. So they always have a really bright light and like I'll, I can literally get rid of all the light in the whole room and then I'm looking up at my head and there's this sleep – this smoke detector that's – this beam of green light down like onto my bed. Yeah, so that thing I, that is going to save your life if there's ever anything wrong with all of the electronics that you have running if I can to keep yourself it, asleep. If I can remove it, I do but a lot of times I can't do that. So what I do – what I found is I take a pair of boxers. And I wrap it around and then use a little bit of p- piece of tape and I basically cover the entire thing with boxers. Wow. So it's it, awesome. <laughs> you completely make it not work. Like it, actually, it will not it detect would, the smoke because the boxers are going to filter it out. It was – there are other rooms. They, they would they would protect <laughs> nah, it. Yeah, so. As long as the fire doesn't start in your room <laughs> with the six sound machines that you're running. Yeah. But the broader, more serious point here, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that sleep is very, very important. And I mean it, it's really important. It just is. And there's a lot of things that you can do to sleep better, to make sure you're getting your REM sleep, to have – they call it sleep hygiene, have a whole sleep routine. And we're going to go deep down into all of these when we do the sleep episode. So that's actually going to be a fun episode. Anything before we move on to number three? No, I'll, I'll save it for the sleep episode. I think that's a good idea. Principle number three, movement. Now, humans, they they say an average of 13 to 15 miles a day is what our ancestors used, used to move on average. And we would always be walking. We'd always either we'd be hunting or we'd be foraging. 
it was just a way of life, like to move. And, and then we're in the wild. So it's not like we're walking on concrete either. We're moving up and down things under trees, over trees, picking up logs, like just doing all kinds of varied movement, which is why you see things like CrossFit have kind of done so well because they mimic a lot of these functional movements. And that is really how humans are designed. And so here's some principles for how you can move more in your life. Park at the end of the parking lot and walk. As opposed to spending three minutes to drive around the parking lot so you can find a space that basically saves you 30 seconds of walking. Wait, why'd you look at me when you said that? Because we all do that, and it's little, it's ridiculous, <laughs> but you probably do it too. Always take the stairs, and I can definitely look at Brent for that one. <laughs> Especially like when I get off an airplane and, I, and people are waiting in line for the escalator, and the stairs, there's nobody. And I like walk down, and, I, and I'm 20 seconds ahead of them. So again, another absurd thing we do listen if you want to feel what it's like for me deciding whether i'm going to take the stairs or the escalator put a hundred pound backpack on your back and then do the same thing yeah well that's a good example though is we need to take the path of more resistance in our in our society because no, we you're don't, right. we don't do move it. enough and we all need to burn more calories in the wild see we're programmed to take the path of least resistance why because calories in the wild are a survival tool yeah yeah they're if important. you run out of calories or you waste calories you will die that's why we like the things that are so calorie dense and that's also why we like laying around being lazy POSs, yeah, right? Like it comes so it. natural to us because it is literally a way to increase the amount of time before we have to have access to more food. And so basically in the wild, gaining fat is a survival mechanism. And we'll talk about that more in uh, later episodes. And so exercise a few times each week. That's pretty standard. We pretty much all know that. Lift something heavy for you one to two times a week. And I, I put lift heavy for you because a lot of people here lift heavy and they think that means hundreds of pounds or whatever. But no, lifting heavy is relative to the person, relative to your level of fitness and, and relative to just lifestyle and all the other variables, right? And so walking daily, especially after meals, that's a huge thing that we should all be doing. Humans are built to walk. We're also built to kind of move long distances for periods of time. Try a standing and or treadmill desk. Do walking meetings. You have anything to add to that? These uh, are all strategies oh, to move more, but we all, most of us know why we should want to move more. Yeah, there's a million different ways that you can do like little things to to move more over the course of the day. Like my watch will tell me every few minutes to like get up and do stuff. Yeah, it's good. Most people ignore it. If you actually listen to your watch and do it, then great. And you do Pomodoro too. Yeah, I do. I I do do the Pomodoro technique when I try to do my work. Explain what that is. Uh, the the Pomodoro technique is a way of getting yourself into deep work while also not overloading your brain. So. You do 25 minutes of deep, intense work sitting down at your desk, no distractions, and then your alarm goes off, and for five minutes, you get up and walk around and don't think about whatever you were doing, and then when that alarm goes off, you get right back down and you do it again. And after you go through four sessions of that, you take a 15-minute break, and I get so much more work done when I do that than if I was, was doing things normally, and it involves me walking around, which is great. Yeah, every all the famous composers, scientists, every, like before... You know, the 19, the, since we had all this technology we had, all like Einstein, um, Beethoven, Bach, like all those guys, they all had walking habits. Darwin, um, Fromm, who was the other big psych, psych, psychologist? Uh, Freud. Freud, Freud, all big walkers. And they had solid routines. It's how they got so much work done. Stephen Hawking, another example. That, that's just, that's just rude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> RIP. You're lucky that, um, a lot of people, for a lot of people, that would have went right over their head, but I know, <laughs> but I know who he is. So, <laughs> principle number four: nature, and then and sunlight in parentheses. The more you can get outside, the better for your health. Walk barefoot, meditate outside, read outside, lounge on the beach. Do everything you can to get outside regularly. Hold on a second, Colin. You're telling me to lounge on the beach, and you also just told me I can't be lounging around. So, walk how do the, those go together? Walk on the beach. Oh, but yeah, in general. We're going to lounge and we're going to relax. That's, that's actually a part of ancestral life. Uh, we also did a lot of gossiping, a lot of sitting around, you know, the fire, things like that. But we also walked and moved the rest of the time, right? Mm-hmm. And like if, if you, if you lay down every day for a couple hours to watch Netflix or whatever, but your job entails that you basically are up on your feet all day, that's not a big deal, right? Like, right. You got yeah, to balance. If you're a server but it's like, or a bartender or something like right, that, you're sitting in front of, sitting at a desk all day. And then going home and, and, and then just like either sitting or laying in front of a TV. Like that's yes. literally the default for most people in our the society. Corporate structure has a lot of problems and I can yep. agree with you wholeheartedly that that's one of them. Yep. So do you have anything, any questions about nature? I mean, there's, there's a lot of research that shows like literally just being in nature is good for you. There's a whole thing that they do. I think it's starting in Japan, but it's, it's called sun. I think it's called 
force bathing or sun or something like that, where you literally go in the forest naked and it's supposed to be all this meditative benefits and health benefits or whatever. Just being like something just listening to Japan. birds, they've proven can make you happier. Also, seeing green can make you happier. Now think about that. So there's a book I'm reading. Uh, it's about kind of like environments and, and urban and, and, and planning and things like that. And it talks about how they did this test in this area that had a lot of graffiti and pollution. It wasn't like a great area. And they decided to plant a bunch of uh, trees and shrubs, right? Add a bunch of green to this, to what was basically a concrete environment. Mm. And the amount of littering and stuff that went, it was, it went down like tenfold or something, like something absurd by simply adding green. Right, because it just made people like respect a little bit more, made them a little bit happier, and it made them feel a little bit more connected to nature. And if you think about what what you'd see when you go in the woods, what do you see? It's literally hundred percent green, like it's all green. Yep. So like the actual color, which is fascinating, the actual color is something that we are biologically programmed to kind of like seek out, and it gives us comfort. And I mean, it's just awesome. It's crazy when you think about kind of stuff. I will caution about walking barefoot. There are some people that would not be able to do that and would get micro fractures. So just be micro fractures. Yeah. The Vibrams uh, running shoes and stuff like that. They had a whole lawsuit because people are using those as like a free form shoe and hurting themselves with them. So just make sure that your body can take it. If you're walking barefoot, it's probably good for you, but don't do anything that well, might hurt. Yeah. And what I'll say to that is if you get micro tears from walking barefoot, it's because you're not walking barefoot. And that's, that's exactly something you need to do to fix your feet. <laughs> Humans are not made to wear shoes. Right. I, I now the only counterpoint that you may have with the, with the vibrams is like we're not made to walk on concrete either. Right. And so like that would be something that's legitimate. We're also not made to like run in concrete or whatever. Like yeah, I don't think anybody's ever hurt themselves walking around on the beach barefoot. Well, unless they're or, burning or themselves. In the, or in the woods or or whatever. Like yeah. we are we are meant to walk on the mo- for the most part areas that have some give. Right. Like yeah, you might climb rocks every so often, but you're not like walking 15 miles on a surface that basically doesn't give in any way and just pushes back onto your joints, right? Mm-hmm. So that makes sense, but we should also be walking barefoot and build those up, build build the muscles up. The muscles in your feet, if you don't train them, it can run into a lot of problems. In fact, my mom has some problems with like her, her toes kind of growing a certain way or whatever just from wearing shoes her whole life. And so we, we try to get her outside. We try to get her walking barefoot as much as possible, but it's something. It's like if you don't use it, you lose it. And so everyone needs to be walking barefoot. Basically, get outside. It's good for you. Simple as that. And my, my preferred way to do it is in the mornings, get sun, get some exercise, walk around barefoot, and just, you know, be in nature for a little bit. It's a great way to start the day. Why don't you read up principle number five? <laughs> so since this is something that I'm new to and something that I'm starting to do, Colin wants me to talk about principle five, intermittent fasting. Make sure you are doing this. The, the quick science behind this is that when you are hungry – you're going to release more adrenaline and try to find your body is like, hey, you're hungry. Time to go find food. So for a bre- for a period of time, you become more aware. You become you get those hormones that make you productive because you need to go find the food. And then it also increases your metabolism. And therefore, in theory, if you're doing the intermittent fasting, you're going to have better weight loss results or weight control results. Or something like that. So that's what kind of got me into it. Humans aren't designed to eat three square meals a day or eat on any kind of fixed schedule. You, you're hungry, right? So if you're not hungry, and I am so guilty of this. I mean, I'm going to, we'll talk about this more so when we talk about actually what's going on in my weight loss, but I will eat when I'm not hungry and I'll eat way past when I'm hungry just because the food is there. I'll eat just to be social. So if somebody says, hey, you want to get your breakfast? I'll go and, and eat and skip those skip those meals go be social go ahead go to breakfast yep. have Look. a black coffee don't yep. have anything that has any calories in it um mix up how much and when you eat try 16 hours off and eight hours on uh try 20 hours on f- off four hours on uh try one single solitary thing that you eat in a day which is what i started off with and i've gone in and out of the 16 8 and the 24 and then aim for at least one full 24 hour fast each week um, and if you're not hungry, don't eat. And even if you get hungry, drink water. Most of the time, the signal that your body is sending when you're hungry is that you need water, mm-hmm. not that you need food. Yep. Because a lot of your food is water. So drink and you'll be fine. The hunger goes away very quickly because your body realizes, okay, I'm hungry. I need to go get food. I'm not going to keep telling you you're hungry. I'm going to, I told you you're hungry. Now get up and go get food. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to bother you until all of a sudden it becomes a serious problem. Yeah, and I'm going to fill in some gaps there, uh, and then we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit. 
How I mean, you've been doing a fasting thing for like how long? Just a couple weeks. Uh, oh, okay. maybe so three you're, weeks. You're really you're super new to it. Yeah. Okay. So fundamentally, because again, the ancestral mind podcast. So we got let's break this down ancestrally. If you walk in the woods, if if you were to go in the woods right now, Brent, what kind of food would you find? Berries and leaves. Maybe. I mean, there's going to be animals, but I'm not going to be able to hunt them. Think about the last time you walked in the woods and you even saw an animal. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, that's like, true. They run away, they hide. Yep. Right. They even fight back if you get close. Mm-hmm. So, I think my point is the difficulty of finding food in the wild. I mean, obviously, our ancestors were good at doing these things, but it's not readily available. And as a result, we didn't have fridges or food preservation or grocery stores or any of that nonsense, right? So, we wouldn't have eaten on any kind of consistent basis, right? And if we would have, it would have been varied at least at different times of the year based on the, the season. Like during the winter, it's not going to be the same food that's available during the summer. And, or, if you, and if you're moving around, different parts of the different areas, you have d- different food access. As pe- as we started to evolve, it would have been an indication of, if you were eating on a regular schedule, it would have been an indication of your class. So you would have been like, you would have been the, the tribe leader and people would have been giving you food or okay, something well, like that. Okay, this is a good example. So there weren't tribe leaders when we were pure well, nomadic yeah, hunter-gatherers. Pure, pure Those are modern day hunter-gatherers. And what, what, I, what I was thinking about this a lot lately because because a lot of the research we have about a lot of modern hunter-gatherers is I, they, I suspect that they have a lot of modern influences as well. Well, a lot, yeah, a lot you of see it with like wolves and stuff, like the alpha wolf and – Yeah, but no, but that's gorillas, champi- chimpanzees, et cetera. Mm. Humans are completely different in that respect. The, true, the truly hunter-gatherer nomadic – wild person before we ever had farming commerce anything hunter guys would literally live their whole life and never even see another human that was outside their group that wasn't born into their group mm. like before humans really populated it spread because when we had access to even other groups of humans we could either we'd either war with them or they, we could trade with them and like have amical agreements right and that would create certain dynamic things for it would it would create certain variables for 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 the whole species right but before we were actually ever had the ability to even see another human because there was, you know, imagine when the planet had only a million humans on it. Now we have 7 billion, right? Imagine when it was like a million of them. Imagine when it was 500,000 of them, right? And so at the Genghis early, Khan killed more than that. <laughs> at the early stages of our, of our evolution, and that was really the purest form of kind of the wild human, there was no class, there was no divide. And we've even seen this in some modern day hunter gatherers that aren't influenced by modern, the modern world. Any one person that kind of raised up in status, they would have things like shaming and, 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 and gossip and public ridicule to basically make sure everyone is even as possible. Now, now think about why that might be the case. Oh, so evolutionary – so it's basically Twitter. Like that's what happened. Somebody gets too famous on Twitter. You go look at their tweets for the last 10 years. Find something you can fucking yell at them for. That's a great analogy, then- <laughs> Brent. But, uh, I, I We're mean, still doing it, Colin. This yeah. isn't something we've abandoned. Yes, but why do you think – if a group of like 20 humans out in the wild somewhere, why would it be they be incentivized to make sure no one person got too much power or social status? I guess the if one person got all the power, then they would be the only one that procreated. Also, okay, and what's another survival trait that you would need to procreate? What like what's another survival resource you would need? What are would are you saying that they would steal all the food? I don't know where you're going with it. They that. would they would they would be able to hoard food. Okay. And those of lower, like lower stat, and you see this with chimps that fight over food and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Those of lower status would get weeded out of the gene pool, right? So, and, and, and then what would happen is it wouldn't be conducive to group survival. And so the evolutionary niche that humans carved out is actually group survival. Everything we did in the early stages of, of, of Homo sapiens, sapiens was how can the group survive? If the group can't survive so that everyone in the group plays by a certain set of rules and you have all these things like if you were to ever hide meat, for example, like the whole group would shame you. And if you ever did anything consistent enough, like maybe you hoarded your fair share or you, or you weren't helpful or you didn't rest. Um, when someone gave you something, you didn't give back. That's why reciprocity is built into our species. You would eventually be ostracized or even killed in the group. And, and most of the time the males actually did the killing and it was, but it was only if the entire tribe agreed. And so like, but think about it. These are weird things that we that nature programmed to our species so that we could best work as a group. If you didn't share with other people, then they wouldn't share with you. And if they if someone gave you something you didn't get back, then eventually they're not going to give you something. And then you could literally, if you get unlucky, you're you're gone. You're out of you're out of the gene pool. So that is the purest form of the human group that we started. And then as you know, time has gone on, we've gotten things like marriage and uh, commerce and resources. And so things have changed and you get a little bit more of that divide. And that's kind of something that's a byproduct more of our modern world and of a world where there were a lot of humans that could interact with each other. 
right? All right. Calm down. Calm so down. We're, we're talking ca- about intermittent fasting. We Colin. are talking about intermittent fasting. <laughs> but so we wouldn't have eaten on any regularity because we couldn't. There would be times of the year where we would fast for maybe days on end. There was times of the year where maybe we'd eat a couple times a day, once a day, whatever. And so the thing with fasting that I that I tell people that you don't hear a lot is intermittent fasting isn't a weight loss hack or tool. It's not a diet. It's literally a way that humans are programmed. You are programmed to eat on a inconsistent schedule, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little, sometimes none at all. And the more you can mix up your eating, the better. Now, in our modern world, obviously, there's certain things that make it hard to do this or whatever, which is why what I found, what works for me, what I've seen work for most people is a 16-8 intermittent fasting window, which means I have a 16-hour fast every single day from the last meal to the first meal of the day before, and I eat almost all of my calories for a day within eight hours. Some people do literally one meal a day. And then they yeah. do like a 24 hour fast. And I, in fact, I did that the other day after we ate at one of those restaurants. I didn't feel good. I literally didn't eat anything the rest of the day and I didn't eat till the next day. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I got like a 22 or three hour fasting. And again, this is about, this is a perfect example of the way humans lived, the way is what the way we are designed. Our modern world is mismatched. We've been convinced that three square meals a day and breakfast or whatever is like the way to go. And all that is is an invention of corporations to sell us breakfast cereal and other crap we don't need. Okay. That's actually how breakfast really came into popularity is like literally selling breakfast cereal to kids like that. And all the, all the TV commercials and everything made, it made breakfast like this huge thing. Um, and then also another kind of, uh, tidbit about breakfast was when the pilgrims came over from your, uh, England or Europe or whatever, and they found the Indians, the Indians didn't really eat on any kind of schedule. They're, they just kind of like did what they want to eat when they want or whatever. And, and the pilgrims were like, these, these, these people are savages. We need to create like a, a strict eating schedule. Right. And like to, to speak, cause civilized people should eat, you know, square meals or whatever. <laughs> right. And so like breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know, and I'm, I'm fuzzy on the exact origin, but that's kind of like the story that I've, that I've read about of, of how that happened. So they handed them smallpox blankets. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, all right, these people are savages <laughs> here. Yeah. And that's the thing with fasting is like everybody should be doing this in some way. And so the biggest thing that the biggest takeaway from principle number five that you can implement literally starting, starting tomorrow is if you aren't hungry, do not force yourself to eat. And you should, the flip, the counterpoint to this is humans are not grazing animals. We are not cows. You should not be snacking. Snacking is like the bane for weight loss. Snacking is the bane for, for your metabolic machinery. Snacking is the perfect way to maintain and gain fat for the human being. And so if you're, if you have any weight loss goal whatsoever, if you ever watch your weight or anything, you have to stop snacking. That's all we're going to cover today because I'm going to do a whole, we're going to do a huge episode on this. We're going to have Logan from Fusion Lean on. Maybe we'll have Jason Whitrock. We're going to have a few people uh, to, to talk about fasting. I'm excited for that show because that's going to be fun. We're going to go down some long, deep, dark rabbit holes on that one. You have anything to add, sir? No, I'll, I'll be there to tell you all the bad habits. So I've got those pretty much locked down. I'll tell you exactly what goes through the mind of a fat person while he's trying to do mental gymnastics to convince himself to continue to eat. That will be good as that's, well. That's my expertise. Mm. <laughs> all right. Principle number six, social. Humans are social creatures because we evolved in small bands of hunter-gatherers. The better we could work together in the wild, the better chances we had at survive, surviving and raising offspring. And so some of the, the key points here are schedule time with friends and family, do game night once a month, meet with a friend, coworker, family member, or accountability partner once a week for coffee. Most important of all, turn off your phone and be present. Now, there's a lot we can go on with this one. There's a lot. But this is probably one of those categories that really has me excited to talk about because people miss it. They, they don't, first of all, they don't understand, they miss it. They don't understand this. They don't, they don't schedule time to do these things because they mm-hmm. think it's not a big deal. And this leads even more into things like groupthink, politics, um, even radical terrorism, things like that, because you get into like, why do we have groupthink? Why do we succumb to mob mentality? Right. And, and literally it's, it's explained th- from our evolution. Now, do I, you- I'm not familiar with the term. Mo- oh, th- you said mob mentality. Never mind. Mob I thought mentality. you said mom mentality. And I'm like, mob. what is that? <laughs> mob. So mob. Okay, another never form mind. of group think, but mob mentality. Yeah. And it, all of these things that like, especially with Trump getting elected and all these things, and obviously we're not gonna go political with this, but you, you notice that politics with social media has become more and more us first them. It's become more polarized. You're either on this side or you're that side, right? It's just become more toxic, really. And, and it's just, it makes sense. It's like it's almost like a thing that the internet was going to create that we probably didn't foresee, but it's just mm. literally taking some of the worst aspects of human nature and what we fall victim to, and just making them easily accessible and 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 just like you know ubiquitous. And there's a voice crazy. to the vocal minority is more so what yeah. it feels like. And 
there's there's an interesting you know this isn't a political show there's but there's an interesting side to this where if you really examine and go down to like we've talked about earlier the first principles of somebody's belief um one of the things that my dad said to me was my dad and i have had different political talks but one of the things he said was that he was talking about the border wall and he he agrees that we should have a border wall because there's so many illegals sneaking in here and they're bad right and and I was like, well, Dad, he was a contractor. You know, he he worked for a mm-hmm. uh, contract floor covering company. He dealt with a lot of people that got here illegally. I I, t- I talked to him and I'm like, Dad, let's let's think about this logically. Like, you've dealt with a lot of people that have crossed the border illegally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish it was easy. He does wish it was easier for them to come. Yeah. But I'm like, okay, you. How many of those people were like shitty? Like yeah. when you finally met them, like how many of them were really shitty? Yep. And they did these bad things. And he's like, well, none. Right, and I'm like, so what do you think is more likely that you're just super lucky and you only dealt with yeah. the good people that cross the border, or that it's overblown the number of bad people that are crossing that border? Mm-hmm. Despite no matter what you think about uh, whether we should have better border security or not, if you really break things down to the basics, I think, and and it was kind of an epiphany for him. He's like, you know what, you're right. Maybe I am thinking about that wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there well, was. A really good documentary on Netflix about that, uh, my enemy or something like that. I can't remember the name of it, but it was an Arab woman that would go talk with some really far right people that yeah, yeah, I, hated I've her. Seen that. And at, without fail, each one of them that she talked to liked her at the end. Yeah. So you know, it's it's interesting. So how do we explain this evolutionarily and ancestrally? Well, I I don't know the answer. I was, well, so the, bra- brainstorming. Like, what what do you think? I I don't know. I mean, I know the kind of the explanation, what's going on here and now. I don't know what defense mechanism or what survival, survivorship bias that would have come from. Well, what what do we just talk about? What what is the evolutionary niche that humans carved out for themselves that allowed us to move to the top of the food chain? Well, we're working. Oh, you know what? Yes. Okay. So working as a group. Group survival. So the group is us versus them. Exactly. And you're going to kind of. Why? Why would that be? Why would you want to have that in the wild though? If you're in the wild and you're 20, you're walking by and you come across this like dude with a spear just hanging out on on a rock somewhere. Okay. Now what? And you don't even speak the same language. Yeah. What do you think the best way to respond to that is? What do I think the best way to respond to that? If you are. Evolutionarily. No, look, if you're a group of, if you're have a tribe of people that you know. And your tribe comes across even just another group of 20 guys over here with spears. You don't speak language and they're sitting here. They're not making any movements. They don't look like they're, they're a threat. They could be, you don't know, right? What would be your best way to most likely survive that encounter? To be skeptical and to, to think be that they might be extremely skeptical. To assume they want to eat you yes. and kill you and take your children. Yeah. That's literally, in fact, there's a lot of stealing women just to have someone that could cook for you and do, and, and then children, women and children. That was like a big thing. It, 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 it's always been like that. And you, so if we, remember how we talk about what about when there's a million humans on planet? Well, you might go your whole life not coming across a human. If you were not extremely skeptical, careful, vigilant, uh, and just assume that like these other humans were dangerous, those humans would have quickly died out because why? They would, they would meet with 10 groups. If nine of them were peaceful, they'd be fine. But every single time they hit that tenth group that was that were cannibals, they'd be wiped out. Their entire their entire tribe would yep. be gone, right? And so it's an it's it's why humans are naturally scared of the unknown because if you just walk into a random cave, you're gonna get eaten. And every single hunter gatherer in the history of hunter gatherers that had this this like laxadaisy attitude in the wild got eaten. Like he, he yep. probably didn't last a week, right? He either got bit by a snake, he did something stupid, or a cat caught him on a you know, behind a tree and, and he was breakfast, right? So this is where I love going down these rabbit holes because it literally explains like when you see people and they get into this group mentality and, and they get really fired up and it's like us for STEM and, and like even racism and tribalism, like, or just your favorite sports team or right. It it's built into us to be us for STEM. And that's why it can, get, it, it can so quickly get violent and toxic because it is, it is a natural survival mechanism for homo sapiens yes. to be afraid of anyone and anything that is unknown because anything and anyone that is unknown is a risk to your survival. Like literally that's it. Like, and so you can start th- looking at all this nonsense we see and just seeing like, wow, it makes so much sense that humans have kind of gone to this level where we literally debate and yell and scream and kick about like the dumbest things, like a difference of opinion or like even like the way religion was like, mm-hmm. let's go kill a bunch of people in the name of like God, something we made up. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's insane. But 
Again, these are all manis- manifestations of the human animal. There's an interesting study you may want to check out that actually put people into groups and studied what they thought of decisions and the morality of those decisions. And without fail, people believe that lying or doing something immoral for the good of the group is actually more moral than doing the right thing if it is detrimental to the group. Oh, yeah, that's easy. So it's just about like, and it was, I think it was lying specifically that they were honing in on. It was like crazy to look at the results. Yeah. And imagine if you're, if you're hunting, like, let's say a big mammoth or, or some other big dangerous thing that like, if you're not on the same page, you're one or more hunters would be killed, Mm -hmm. right? If you don't have a solid set of beliefs, if you don't literally trust the other people in your band, your group, with with your life or or basically with like a shared belief system, you just wouldn't be successful, right? Or or you would at least increase the odds that you wouldn't be successful. And those genes over hundreds of thousands of years would have been weed out of the gene pool, which is why the humans that survived were very good at all thinking the same things, right? Having shared that's why we have like shared beliefs. That's why God's c- c- and stories and these things come so natural to our species because these are all things that we use to survive that group and in a group. And then it basically and uh, explain things. Procreate, procreate, procreate. And so we now have billions of humans. And now we have all these splinter groups or all these small groups around the world and all these different niches and everything. And it's why like it even applies to business and marketing. Like you got to sell to a niche and then you want to build a tribe and like all these things. Like we're literally just tapping into the natural human psyche. And that's why understanding these things is like a must for living the best life you can. Like you need to understand your biology and your psychology to be able to actually be effective and have a good life. So that's six. That was number six. <laughs> Remember well, we, we thought two, this was going to be a quick episode? We got two bonus principles. So let's just get into it. Uh, we got these. These are good. These are more, I would say, mindset. These are more like how to be effective today. But bonus principle number seven is self-awareness. Now, I've been an entrepreneur for um, 14 years now. And probably self-awareness is the number one tool that everyone needs to have if they want to be successful in business. Because like, if you don't know yourself, if you don't know why you do things, like it's just really, really hard to do anything successfully. And this, but this also applies to relationships, friendships, you know, even climbing the corporate ladder, having a job, having bosses, having coworkers. Like if you don't understand the things that motivate you and, and, and your pitfalls and the things that trigger you, like, I don't know, Brent, how do people survive? That's what I sometimes wonder. Like, how did this person survive 40 years in our modern world with that kind of mindset? Like I see this crap all the time. Well, we're not we're not in natural selection stage anymore, Colin. So know, things are a lot but different even still, now. Like, how do they manage to pay their bills and like drive a car places? Like, it's just insane. Like, people get by, and I guess yeah, that that's a per example of how like our modern world tends to actually coddle people and keep them alive. And this, I mean, I'm not suggesting not that, that that's wrong. No, it's not that that's wrong. Thing. But in the wild, that would have never happened. If yeah. you were weak minded, if you, and if you didn't get along with the group, you would literally die off. Your genes would die off. And so now it's a completely different environment. But so what are some things self-awareness wise that like, what are your thoughts on this? Have you, have you thought about this a lot? Like self-awareness is kind of something like you either think about it or you don't really. Yeah. I, so there's definitely rabbit holes that I've gone down on in my own mind when I'm looking at the self-awareness aspect of things. Some of them are not pretty. Like I, I'll, I'll start reading about a sociopath. And I'm reading the check marks and I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay, that's me. Uh, uh-oh. Well, we all have those tendencies. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh. But you're de- you're so far from a sociopath. It's not even funny. <laughs> it's, it definitely scares me when I have to, to look into the why I do things. Same thing. Like, I have to examine myself and look, take, go outside and look at why I'm a fat dude. Why? How did I get here? What caused yeah, that's a good thing me to, to get here? What? mental gymnastics do i take myself through the excuses that i make to myself Mm -hmm. that make me do these things and the excuses that i can give other people like if you if you are my boss and i did something wrong i'm gonna trick you and tell you that i didn't do anything wrong like i can mental gymnastic my way through that and have you follow me and do flips and stuff i can't do flips in person but my brain is so good at tricking me into doing things like oh you, you can just eat that cupcake this time i know you don't even really want it but like if you just had the frosting, that's probably fine. And then 16 cupcakes later, I'm like, well, what happened there? So examining the why you do things is just as important as examining the why you should do things that you're not doing. Yeah. Why are you doing things the way that you're doing them? Self-awareness. I and think a lot of people literally, you tell them self-awareness and they just don't even know. They look at you with like a blank stare. Mm-hmm. Like this is just something that a lot of people aren't even aware of. It's a scary introspective. I mean, you no, know, it, it is. It's hard. It's not easy. There's people that will just say, necessary. you know, God is. God is the one who's moving me or whatever, if yeah, they believe in that. Sure. And that's comforting. It's, it definitely, like when I was it's a easier. kid going to a Catholic school, it was a little bit more comforting before like I started to question my reality. Oh, yeah, there's just somebody who controls all my actions and like I'm 
Sure. De- I'm living forever as soon as I die. It's cool. Yeah. That, <laughs> that is not a luxury that I have anymore. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, introspection, meditation is really difficult for me. I've tried it a couple of times. That is when I go down those rabbit holes in my mind and I'm just like, Yeah, I never- you might. Well, we're going to do a show on meditation, obviously. But I think I have a lot of things to talk about that. A lot of, a lot of meditation specifically, people think it should be this perfect thing or whatever. But just a practice of observing your thoughts is really what meditation is about. Uh, so for self-awareness, some, some things that work for me is reading philosophy, Stoke philosophy in, in specific was just, I mean, it's life-changing stuff. You can find uh, oh. any, any Ryan Holiday's books are really good on that stuff too. I'm going to pimp an episode of our podcast, actually, of the crypto podcast. You're okay. not here to listen to cryptocurrency news. Yeah, but, but you'll enjoy some shows if they got value. We did an entire episode on cognitive biases oh, yeah. and how that now we do relate them specifically to cryptocurrency and some of the things, yep. but I would say at least 80% of that episode is just exploring cognitive biases that affect you and how they affect you. And we, my co-hosts on that show are great. We're funny. It's, uh, what Colin knows, it? Colin knows Mike. He's one of yep. my co-hosts. Uh, I don't know what episode number it is, but it's called cognitive biases. One Oh one. What was your number one cognitive bias? Uh, or at least the one that you remember the most that sticks out the most. The, the confirmation bias is, yeah. is the number one thing. You look back at something that worked and, and think about the reasons that it worked rather than, or uh, something that didn't work or and something you, that didn't you think work. You know yes. why it didn't work. Being results oriented, right. that kind of thing. So yeah. those things are, or, or survivorship. Uh, I don't know if we talked about that, but you'll see. I have a good story for that. You, you'll see the best and the brightest of a business, but you don't see all the failures. All the, yeah. It's the guy who won the lottery. It's, yep. Uh, look at me. I won the lottery. All you had to do is keep working more and buying more tickets, and eventually this would be you. Yeah. So there's a difference between survivorship, uh, survivorship, and looking at those people, and a difference between the people who did the hard work to get there and created a good system and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, let, let's definitely do a whole show on that. Uh, yeah, well, we could report report I, over the cognitive biases and really talk about how they apply to fitness and stuff. I would be well ready, well prepared for that because I've thought about all those things. If you don't want to listen to a podcast, there's a couple of great books on it. One of them that I like is called Think Twice. Harnessing the power of counterintuition. Daniel and Kahneman. No, it's uh, well, that's thinking fast and so. Yeah, uh, it, I think so wait, this guy is, is twice? Michael something. He's a professor. I, I think his last name is Mabusi. Think twice. Ha- ha- harnessing the power of counter intuition. Intuition. Michael Mabusin. Yeah. Okay, I was right on that. I don't yeah. know if I read this. That's it's very good. I've read most books. <laughs> <laughs> any book that's ever been written Colin's done it or at least most book. popular books <laughs> alright so I think it's good for uh, bonus principle number 7 the final note on self-awareness is if you don't have self-awareness no matter what you do in your life no matter how much money you make no matter what you accomplish it will never be as much as you could and you will never appreciate as much as you could because you you just haven't you haven't answered the big questions that you need to answer for yourself and that's why at the end of this it, it has consider seeing a therapist and a lot of people might think that a oh, therapist yeah right Therapy is actually for everybody, and there should be no shame around it. That's all I'll say on that. Let's get to bonus principle number seven. Eight. Right. Action bias. What, what do you think I mean by action bias, Brent? I actually don't know what you mean by this. I, I haven't read this yet. So so what, what? what's bias? If you have a bias for action, what does that mean? That mean, I guess that means that you just do something before you think about it. Or <laughs> No, that's not it. No? I mean, I mean, I guess it could mean that, but action bias is your natural tendency is to take action. Okay, so right. what I said is accurate. Doing something before you think about it. Yeah, but it's not, I mean, you can think about it a little bit. But yeah, but it's not about not You don't sit about here it. plotting. I've seen people do this. I'm going to throw my co-host Kareem under the bus a little bit. He bought the equipment to do a podcast for our crypto podcast mm-hmm. six months before we ever started one to yeah, do his own and never did it. Sure. But he bought $1,000 worth of podcasting equipment. Yep. And he had all the best equipment. He had researched everything properly. Yep. But the only action that he took was buying. So and now we're we're a year and a half, a 160 people- episodes into our show. Yep. Once we took the action, he's an amazing co-host. He is really awesome to listen to and talk. That's that why was- that well, that's why we have an action bias because that's what people do. Mm-hmm. They make plans, they write down, they journal, they do all this stuff, right? They they build this huge amazing business plan, and they haven't even just like focused on getting their first customer. Yeah. If right? you're or one they of haven't focused on just like writing their first thing or doing whatever. If you know? you're one of the listeners who's got multiple business plans, multiple business ideas, you've gone to your friends and you're like, I have this great idea for an app. I have this great idea for a movie. I have this great idea for a book. And you haven't done anything on any of it. Just pick one tomorrow and start it. 
anything you do is better than the idea. Well, and read The Lean Startup by Eric, Eric Reese or Rice or whatever. That's a must read. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to read this here. Happy and productive people share common traits. The most important is a bias for action. The more you can do things in your life on purpose, and again, so this is not about not thinking about it, right? right. It's on purpose. So you're going to make a plan, but then you're going to go do the damn thing, right? Rather yeah, than just responding, damn thing. To, rather, rather than just responding to your environment, the better your life will be. In fact, let me start the whole sentence over because you totally interrupted it. The more you can do things in your life on purpose, <laughs> rather than just responding to your environment, the better. Because it's got commas in there. I got to finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the better your life will be. The more you don't will, respond to your environment, it doesn't matter. If I said anything. <laughs> the more you will eliminate the bad things from your life while attracting the good. Always aim to do, then learn from that doing and do more with the new information. This is a surefire path to a better life. And so it's about getting the habit of just doing things. Most people don't. Most people mm-hmm. get in the habit of talking about things or talking about doing things. Talking about it will You're give you that doing same it. dopamine response exactly. a lot of times too. It, it, because it makes people feel like they're actually doing something, but they're not. Yeah. Buying the stuff a cream gave him a dopamine hit. He's like, oh yeah, I'm serious. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to spend thousand dollars, right? Do the thing. The like the success in life, business, whatever is to take action. Like if you, re- if you hear something on this podcast and you're like, yeah, that's great. Do something to implement it. Test it for a week. You know, tomorrow, just do one thing, like skip lunch, like whatever. Do something. Because when you do something, you're more likely to do something else. And then you're more likely to do something else. And then the snowball, the flywheel, it gets moving in your direction for the better. And it becomes easier and easier to do. And, and on the flip side, though, is the, the more you think about doing something and every day you think about doing it, the less likely you are to do it. It's like a reverse yep. negative flywheel because you're in the habit of just thinking about it. You're not actually doing it. And imagine the first time you get the positive feedback while you're actually doing the thing. It just pushes it forward even more. Yep. An example is uh, weight loss. Same thing. The first time I lost weight, I didn't tell anybody. I just did it. Yep. I just started. I just started. And at the time, I was doing calories in and out. And I just did it. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't talk about it. I'm not like, hey, I'm going to be on a diet, everybody. Or, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing that. Eventually, somebody said something to me. And they're like, dude, you lost a lot of weight. Which, <laughs> to be fair, is if you're a fat person and you listen to this, you're probably not. But if you are... You know that people say that all the time when you gain weight. So, but when they actually, they say it differently when you lose. So there's people that say you lost weight, but they're really looking at you and they're like, you gained weight. And they just say it because they have to say something about your weight. Then I've there's, never experienced that. Uh, well, yeah, you've never been fat. So <laughs> thanks. But I'm telling you it's a thing. Other fat people, if you're listening, please comment and tell us that that's, you feel the same. Um, but the, the point is when somebody says that, when nobody knows you're trying to do anything and they just happen to see you and they're like, whoa, wow. Yeah. That is another just – it pushes you forward. The first one of you sent us an email about this show or the first one of my first podcast listeners sent us an email about the show and said, yeah, we're that frame, is – We're going to frame that email. Get those emails coming to info for now because we don't have an email yet, but it's info at wildfoods.co. We'll take them. And send them to uh, – address to Brent because Colin's ego doesn't need actually any extra – That's <laughs> not true. I don't have an ego. I'm just I'm just confident in what I know I am. <laughs> which is the best uh, alright so guys if you want to read the rest of our Living Wild presentation and kind of see some of the things we talked about today go to wildmission.co uh, I would recommend reading the whole thing or kind of skimming through it the middle part we went over is like slide 25 I think it's actually showing me the slides here for some reason and you'll find in there it's free to access it's always online I highly recommend you do that now let's get on to the personal life stuff and rant section that we need to figure out a good name for section of the show. <laughs> yeah, we gotta come. We gotta come up with like a good drop for that. That's like it can't be what grinds my gears because I don't want to. Like it's not just rants. Like I want to talk about stuff too. And also this this one we're gonna have to keep. We're gonna have to keep shorter than usual because I desperately need a glass of water. We're already an hour into this thing. We can yeah. skip the. We can skip no. the personal stories. Of, no, uh, no, no. I mean, I we're, gonna, we're gonna do a little bit because why? Because the more we talk about doing something. The harder it is to do it, but the more we do something, the easier it is to do it. <laughs> so we're going to do it and not talk about doing it. See, uh, guys, we we make the Kool Aid and we drink it. Yeah, but we don't but, put sugar in no it. There's no sugar, Stevie. It's not- it's stevie or monk fruit Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, personal life stuff and rants. Wait, wait, hold on. What would the monk fruit Kool Aid man be like? Would he just like pop in like through the door instead of through the wall? And then be like, oh, um, well, monk fruit are, are these, they're these balls. Yeah. It, it could be like a green ball with a face on it. And he could maybe he could like roll in. He could like roll in through the door. Push and he's down. like super hairy. Uh, no, they're, it's like a green. I guess I've never seen, I've never seen a monk fruit. I'm just yeah. picturing like a monk instead of a fat guy. Yeah. It's a little, it's like a green thing like this. Let's get to it. Personal <laughs> yeah. life stuff and rants. What do you got? 
I, I mean, I, I told you I didn't have anything ready, but you know what? Since since I I haven't stopped thinking about it since we just had lunch. We were at lunch. Breakfast for me. Uh, or dinner, whatever. It was 5 p.m. So I don't know what you want to call it. It's the first Breakfast. meal I had. Breakfast. We ordered an item that they served in like a... Like I a, can't believe you're hung up on this. Like I, To me, it's it's nothing. It blew my mind. It's, and it blows your mind. They, they served us an item in like a in like a standing cup. It's one of those things... I, I, Colin probably doesn't want me to tell you what we were eating, but it, it was fries. French and, fries. French fries. We had truffle french fries, and they put them in this stand-up cup. Like So you eat them, and it's like a higher-end restaurant or whatever. And we were splitting them. So Colin dumped them out onto the little plate that they had given us and handed er, hand, and moved the cup, right? So then the, the server comes by, and he goes, oh, man, that is like the ultimate way to share, to share something. And I look up at him like, wait, what? He's And then he his exact words, I never thought about doing that before. Yeah. And when you're thinking about the mindset and you're thinking about mindfulness and you're thinking about all these things about people who may not have survived in a different society, somebody who hadn't thought about pouring the French fries out of a plate. I'm going to defend the guy. I'm going to defend the guy. It is. I'm going to defend him now. Okay. Damn millennials. (laughs) So for me, it's not a big deal at all because one, he's working in a business, right? What what, What's something that defines good businesses? Employees that understand that they can pour on french fries so that people <laughs> no, can share them that's not at all <laughs> no, systems man, I that was systems yes. right and every dish has a certain presentation and a certain system and so most people eat it right out of the cup because it's just served that way but we want to really get in there and get all our hands all greasy and get all that truffle goodness right <laughs> and so we dumped it out or i dumped it out and it was on a plate and it was easier for each of us to grab so i don't have your greasy grubs all over my fries yeah right perfect solution that's been around forever <laughs> <laughs> right but if he's literally never seen someone at the restaurant eat that way, and maybe a lot of people haven't, then I would it would make sense that it's just not something that even entered his consciousness because all is all he is thinking is how do I serve these fries the same way every time? So that's his defense, and it's not that mind blowing. But you know, some people like Brent, they're entertained by small things, and so you gotta let them have that. Like that's just part of life for some people. I'm entertained by both small and big things, and I also am entertaining with small and big things. So and- I don't. I mean, I yeah, I wasn't prepared for rants either. I think, I think we satisfied the... <laughs> <laughs> I guess the fry story is it for today. Yeah. No, uh, I, maybe I'll just do a little value bomb real quick. So I'm going to recommend something. Wait, wait. We should absolutely... Hold on. We got to start doing like... There's No, no, no. There, every time you up. say value bomb, there needs to be a... <laughs> oh, totally. A something that... So I'm putting it... All right, Colin, I want you to start over and I want you to say, I'm going to give you all value bomb. And then pause. Yeah. I'm going to give you all value bomb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, now I forgot my value bomb. Oh no! no it's, it's a service that I that I found about two months ago. It's absolutely amazing. It, this is not sponsored. Oh, so we got to do a disclaimer. So real quick, guys, fasting you do it at your own risk. This is not medical advice. This is not nutrition advice. These are our personal opinions about things that we think the world should do if they want to be smart human beings. But that is not us telling you you should do these things, and you are doing them at your own risk. Ask blah, blah, blah. a medical professional. Ask if a this medical is professional. Okay. You know, consult your doctor, especially if you're breastfeeding, pregnant, or on medication, and just don't do dumb stuff. Skipping a meal here and there, you know, ask your doctor, but I don't think it's going to be a big deal, right? But like going like seven days without food, like if you've never done it in your life, that's going to be a problem. That's probably stupid. Don't don't, don't just do that. Go from zero to right. Okay, with that out of the way, the value bomb I'm dropping is a service for unlimited ebooks and audiobooks. Unlimited for $8.99 a month, and the service is. I think it's scribed or scribed. I'm not sure how you say it, but it's S C R I B D dot com. It is absolutely insane. You get the app on your phone just like Audible, and they have a huge selection of audiobooks and uh ebooks. So I mean I've listened to like 20 books already. And if I would have had to pay those books through Audible, because I also subscribe to Audible, I it would have cost me, you know, literally two hundred dollars actually. And I literally listened to twenty mm-hmm. books in two months for like sixteen bucks. We will always I want to point this out. We will always attempt to let you know when you're listening to an ad. Versus something that we actually are doing. And if it's an ad that we also happen to use, even better. But we will try to mention those that we've are gonna been be compensated the only ads. for Those something. are going to be the only ads we ever do, though. Yeah. I, I, I will never promote something I don't use. Or at least that's not good for the end consumer health or life-wise. Right. Like, so we're not going to, you know, we would never recommend you buy, like expensive fashion clothing or i don't know like what what would be another thing that's like just uh we're not gonna have any brownie sponsors on the podcast yeah yeah or or even like fake 
keto food or fake like gluten free junk food, like which I'm not a fan of either, right. right? Which is like becoming a whole big market, and we'll we'll definitely talk about that on the nutrition show. Now, do we have any closing comments, things, recommendations, calls, re- recommended shows, books, right now? Articles? Here, here's what we want. We the call to action here is please give us a rating on iTunes. It's super important that for these first few episodes iTunes knows that we're listening so we can get us in front of more people and expand our community. So And on YouTube. And honest rating. You don't have to give us – if you hate us, if you hate every time hey, call it, and talks, you know, whatever. It's good for the algorithm. That's but, fine. But uh, we prefer a five-star. And like and comment on YouTube and subscribe to us on YouTube. Yeah. Every, everywhere that you get your podcasts, we, we can be subscribed to. This – episode was sponsored by wild foods you can get your real food supplements and ingredients over at wildfoods.co check out our full selection of superfoods and use code am podcast 12 for 12 percent off your entire order i think it's a wrap am podcast 12 is the code okay all right thanks for listening guys we out the members of the ancestral mind podcast are not nutritional advisors or anything like that record that shit all In all nutrition has inherent risk. Please do your own all research. Nutrition. All nutrition has inherent risk. Please do your own research. Never invest more in nutrition than you can afford to lose. <laughs>